This is Dapsone, an antibiotic that treats a skin infection called leprosy, along with a bunch of autoimmune diseases. You are an organic chemist in the middle of trying to synthesize this oh-so-important drug. One of your synthesis steps is to add this chlorine onto nitrobenzene. However, when you try this reaction out, you end up with a really bad yield. It's not adding to the opposite or para side like you intended, but it's adding to this side instead, also known as the meta side. And your boss is just not going to have that. So why does this reaction have a bad yield? And the answer to that is how electrons move. And so by the end of this video, not only are we going to uncover the answer and find the way around this problem, but we are also going to understand some of the most basic elements of organic chemistry. Where electrons go when they move, how electrons move around, and apply both of these to understanding how electrons move around inside a molecule. These skills are going to be an important part of your toolkit for your organic chemistry journey. So buckle up and let's get started. This will be a quick recap. You can check this video out if you want a more in-depth explanation of orbitals. I'm also going to assume that you all know your organic nomenclature. So please be sure to revise those things before moving on. Before quantum mechanics, people thought electrons move around as if planets would orbit their stars. However, this was soon debunked and electrons actually occupy these things called orbitals. Orbitals tell you where electrons would probably be as opposed to where they would precisely be, as that's actually physically impossible. There are many types of orbitals, but the common thing between orbitals is that they can hold a maximum of two electrons each. Now, orbitals don't only just describe how electrons actually behave in atoms. If you take two orbitals and overlap them, you create what we typically know as a chemical bond. Knowing that, let's try that out on the most important element to organic chemistry, carbon. Carbon only has enough electrons to go to the second level, so that's all the orbitals we're going to use. 1, 2s orbital and 3, 2p orbitals. The 1s is too low in energy to count. If we tried bonding these carbons together, you end up with something that looks like this which is actually a far cry from reality. You see, these hydrogens have electrons, and electrons repel each other. So they're going to try to stay as far away from each other as possible. So while this structure might fly in two dimensions, this shape here, called a tetrahedron, works much better in three dimensions. It's also quite beautiful that if you take the orbitals and add them all up, you also get the same shape. And since you took all three of the 2p orbitals and one s orbital, we call this the sp3 hybridized orbital. Applying this idea to double bonds, you can see that it has to spread out into something that kind of looks like a fidget spinner, 120 degrees angles away from each other. Orbital-wise, you can do this by combining all the orbitals except for one 2p orbital. Since you've only used two of the p orbitals, we call this orbital sp2. You can also see that the double bond in double bonds can be easily explained using orbitals too. This bond created by the orbitals facing head-on is called the sigma orbital, but the ones facing side-on are called pi orbitals. Last but not least, in the case of triple bonds, we only use one of the p orbitals, and we call this hybridization sp. Now, let's move on to the new content. As future users of organic chemistry, I'd like you to think of hybridized orbitals not as just things behind the nature of bonds, 
but a different type of building joints for your organic molecule. You'll see what I mean. Not only are the bond types different in stiffness, three bonds obviously stronger than one, but they also have different rotation abilities. SP3 can rotate around itself freely, as if it were a free joint, super similar to wheels on an axle. SP2 isn't as easy to rotate, but it's not impossible. It just takes a little bit of motivation in the form of energy. Which is, fun fact, one of the ways scientists design controllable rotation in nanobots. And SP is pretty much impossible to rotate. So it's very much the axle to your chemical structure. You can see all of this in action in this nanocar design. SP3 rolls out like a wheel, SP2 is the motor, and SP functions as an axle. And now that we understand the sorts of places where electrons stay in, now let's move on to the way electrons can move around. In chemistry, chemical reactions usually involve bonds being broken and reformed. And we've just learned that bonds are just electrons shared between atoms. So in fact, chemical reactions are essentially electrons being moved around. Let's take this simple acid-base reaction, for example. It's a reaction between an organic acid, called a carboxylic acid, and a hydroxide ion, which you can find from stuff like sodium hydroxide. And the way organic chemists communicate the movement of electrons is by using arrows. When a pair of electrons moves to either form a new bond or land themselves on an atom, we draw an arrow from the starting point to the ending point. For instance, the electrons in the OH bond here gets moved on to the oxygen. Orbital-wise, this is just electron pairs being promoted from a bonding orbital to an antibonding orbital, hence the name antibonding. But this is a little beyond the scope of this course, so we'll mostly stick to our sticky Lewis structures. Overall, what chemists would write is something like this diagram to indicate how this reaction happens, or in other words, the mechanism of this reaction. And of course, a problematic reaction also has a mechanism. Let's take a look at it. First, I'm going to show all the hydrogens of this benzene ring here. Our goal, as you know, is to add the chlorine onto the ring. And the way you do that is by using this complex here but we're not gonna worry about it too much. Just keep in mind that the chlorine is positively charged. This will be important for later. The double bond attacks the chlorine and anchors onto the ring. The rest of this is just cleaning up steps, which leaves the product we want. Wait, but even understanding this mechanism, should it not even matter where we have the nitro group? It should still work the same, shouldn't it? Yeah, it doesn't. The key answer is actually what we're going to talk about next. It's not just about how electrons move between molecules, but how electrons move around inside a molecule. Let's take a look at this molecule here. What can you do with it? it is that you can move the lone pair on the oxygen onto this bond and move the C double bond C bond onto the carbon as a lone pair. And if you're still sharp on your Lewis structures, you know this is still valid, the octet rule and everything. These sorts of structures where you move only the electrons around, not the atoms, are called resonance structures. The thing is, this movement of electrons that we see and I say movement with quotes, is actually just the surface level of what's going on underneath. If we revealed all the orbitals on this molecule, this is what you'll see. You can either choose to bond these to a pi bond or these into a pi bond. So you see, it's just pi orbitals swapping and that's what resonance essentially is. So to look for where resonance is going to happen, you need to only look 
for p orbitals sticking out in the same direction, just like this. This kind of thing is also known in the chemistry lingo as pi systems. Note, for those of you who are quite strict on Vesper and Lewis structures, you might think that hybridization for this oxygen is actually sp3, since there are three lone pairs and one stick, so they want to spread out as much as possible. However, you actually wind up being more stable if you chose to make an sp2 to join with the pi network instead. So that's why hybridization of anything with a lone pair next to a pi system would try to turn itself into an sp2 to contribute more to the pi system, making the whole thing much more stable. Well, to be honest, I've actually been lying to you a little. Resonance structures are actually, in fact, just mere reflections of the real thing. You see, there's no physical law preventing the p orbitals from just all combining into one. So in reality, where the electrons are located are actually a weighted mix of resonance structures. And I say weighted since the electrons are going to want to spread out but spend more time near the more electronegative oxygen, making the left structure what we call the best Lewis structure. And the map of this thing would look something more like this. This nature of how resonance works is also how conductive polymers work. The entire p orbital network is combined together to make one long orbital that electrons are pretty much free to move around in. If you apply the voltage, you can actually move the electrons freely, just like normal wires. And now that we understand resonance, we can move on to the final few steps of our problem. Since adding the nitro onto the nitrobenzene seems to be the culprit of our problem here, let's start using our knowledge of resonance right here. Pause and try if you like. I highly recommend pausing right after the arrows show up. But first, before we do that, let's check how many points we can actually connect. Remember, we can't connect to sp3 orbitals, we can only connect to protruding p orbitals. And looks like we're in good shape. The entire molecule has p orbitals pointing out, so it's really ready to do resonance. Let's try three of the most basic ones first. You can move the double bonds around. You can also drop the charge of the oxygen down to the double bond and knock the other double bond onto the oxygen. You can also do both of those things in the same structure. So there's three more structures, four in total now. Now, let's do the next ones. You can jump the benzene's double bond onto the CN double bond and the NO's double bond onto the oxygen. And by calculating formal charges, the carbon now holds the positive charge, which we can move around using these arrows like so. Again, if you feel like this is still kind of a little trippy, try doing practice on this. You'll get better eventually, promise. Let's take a look at the bottom tree structures. You see that the positive charge get swapped around the location in red here. And since we know resonance actually spreads out through the entire molecule, so when the positive chlorine comes along, it won't be attracted to the positive carbons, but to the barely negative-ish carbons in blue, since positive charges repel. And this is why the yield for the other positions, including our pair position, is so bad in comparison with the meta position because it gets repelled away before it can even do a reaction. Okay, so we found the problem. What's the solution? And like oftentimes in organic chemistry, a simple trick suffices. You just start with another chemical entirely. Instead of adding chlorine to nitrobenzene, let's add the nitro to the chlorobenzene instead. And if you find the resonance of chlorobenzene, as you can see here, you find that the meta and para positions now have negative charges. Again, I highly recommend you try figuring this out on your own first for practice. You see now, if you add on the positive nitro group, it will add where we want as opposed to what we had earlier. Problem solved, bada bing bada boom.
So to recap all of that, orbitals are where electrons live. Hybridized orbitals determine the shape, mobility, and special properties of the molecule. Reaction arrows tell you how the electrons move around, and the series of those is called a reaction mechanism. Electrons moving around inside of a molecule is called resonance, and that is caused by p orbitals. Well, technically, they're not even moving, they're just shared among p orbitals, and that share is determined by stability. And why do we need to know about resonance? It's because it tells us where electrons spend most of their time, affecting all sorts of things, such as favoring some reactions above the others, which can result in a totally different compound with totally different properties, or our boss firing us from our firm. And by understanding all of this, we've now fixed our problem, and your boss of a scientist can now be happy with your progress and actually give you pay. This has been an episode of Chem 123. See you next time.